Welcome to the Right Time Podcast. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. You can send us a tweet at the 1-800-Flowers.com Twitter feed. That's at Bomani underscore Jones. Oh, man. I hadn't done radio in a while, right? I was doing PTI for a few days. Came, you know, I had a convention. Came down here to Miami. Doing highly questionable for a little while. Been traveling, man. But before I left, the homie Kyrie was saving us with all this good content that he was providing by not wanting to go to the Cavs. And while I was gone, Kyrie didn't provide no content. And then I came back yesterday, and we were like, ooh, I sure could use some content. And Kyrie was nowhere to be found. I'm like, hey, yo, Kyrie, Tuesday coming up. What you got for me, bro? And then Woj was like, hold my 40. And he comes up, and he's like, all right. And what did Woj come with us with? Okay. Woj put out the report on ESPN.com, basically that the Cleveland Cavaliers are hoping that they are going to be able to get a franchise player back in return for Kyrie Irving. That's the play that they are making, to try to get a franchise player back for Kyrie. And I got to say, getting a franchise player back in a trade for Kyrie would be pretty impressive. Why would it be pretty impressive? Because it is very, very rare that you trade a player as good as Kyrie and get back a player as good, if not better, than him. That tends not to happen very often. Now, if you do not get a player who is better than Kyrie Irving in that trade, then you are not getting a franchise player. How do I know that? Because Kyrie Irving is not a franchise player, or at the very least, Kyrie Irving has not demonstrated to me that he is a franchise player. Now, to be fair, uh, James Harden, when the Rockets made the trade for him, had not demonstrated himself to be a franchise player, and then very quickly, like in one game, demonstrated he was, in fact, a franchise player. But the Cavs are not going to get a franchise player in trade for Kyrie Irving. On top of that, we find out that the Cavs are operating under this idea that LeBron ain't coming back. They feel as though if LeBron does not commit to coming back, then LeBron is not coming back, and they are going to make trades with the thought process being that LeBron is not going to come back. Right. That's the game that they are playing. Now, in just a couple of minutes, we're going to go to some sound uh, from our good friend Brian Winhurst about this. But in the meantime, ESPN Fantasy Football Marathon is going on, so make sure you sign up and play on ESPN.com or in the ESPN Fantasy app, Android, iPhone, iPad. Play in a private league with friends or join a public league and be matched with other ESPN fans. Play in up to 25 leagues. It's completely free. Bow. Anyway, here's Brian Winhurst talking about what the Cavs and Kyrie and LeBron got going. David, what we have here is a poker game. What the Cavs and LeBron and Kyrie are doing are bluffing, who's going to call, who's going to raise. It's a very intriguing situation. So what you have the Cavs essentially sending the message is, LeBron, if you will not commit to us, we will not commit to you. If you can't tell us you're going to be with us past this year, then when we make a trade, it's not going to be just for this year. Do they really want to do this? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe what they're looking for is to get LeBron to commit so that they can pick a path and they can – Uh, maybe even rescue the Kyrie Irving situation. But in my discussions with sources around LeBron, he does not intend to make any commitment to anybody. Hold on, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, bro, wait a minute, bro, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Cavs think they go strong on LeBron into making some level of commitment to them? Are you serious? Like, has any threat ever been more empty than the Cavs saying, we going to make trades for the future if you don't give us an answer, LeBron? Probably looking at them like, fine, then don't. What are you talking about, right? There's no way in the world that LeBron is buying that one. None whatsoever. Like, to me, this doesn't even sound to me truly like it is the Cavs and Kyrie and LeBron making moves. One, there is no move that Kyrie is able to make, right? Like, Kyrie doesn't have it in him to make a move. He's the guy with two years left on his contract. He's the dude that doesn't have anywhere to go. Right? No, 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 no. Kyrie, all he can do is just sit around and wait for the trade to wind up happening. Now, the Cavaliers are in an interesting place when it comes to trying to figure out what to do with trades because there is a future that they have to prepare for without LeBron James. See, here's the thing that LeBron has going for him that gives him an uh, an uncommon level of power, especially within this situation. Kyrie is out here like, man, I sure hope they trade me to a situation that's good. Right? Right? The Cavs are like, well, we sure would like to be a contender, even if LeBron's gone. LeBron's like, 
I am the walking definition of contention. I show up, it's a contender, right? You drop LeBron off, put him on the New Orleans Pelicans. It's a contender. You take LeBron, drop him off in the French Quarter. Get 11 dudes. It's a contender. Take LeBron off the Cavs. It's Cleveland. That's what we got, guys. Like, like, like that, that, is, that is what we have here. I'm trying to think of how hard LeBron's laughing at the idea that the Cavs think they're about to strong all LeBron James. Where the hell we all been for the last 14 years? If the Cavs are ever in a position to try to strong all LeBron James into something, I feel pretty confident they would have done it already. They ain't got the juice to strong all LeBron. They don't have the power to strong all LeBron. And on top of not having the power to strong all LeBron, I would think that they would have the good sense to know not to strong all LeBron. But here we are talking about Dan Gilbert and good sense. Look, bottom line, is this they are promised one last year of contention and they are promised it because they have lebron on the roster and lebron's not gonna go anywhere you are promised to be a contender this year lebron leaves you will not be a contender now there may be a chance that you can make a couple things happen shuffle some things and then you can ultimately become a contender now granted that course of becoming a contenders contender is probably going to require you to try to find some way to convince a free agent to come to cleveland and the one free agent who would come to cleveland already did it and we ain't think he would do that either Right, right. You got one year, LeBron. Your trades need to be all in line with, let's try to get us this championship this year because that's what we got. We don't have anything outside of this year. Cavs come to LeBron. Well, if you commit to us, maybe we're LeBron looking at them like, Psh, you got to be kidding me. He's like my homeboy. It was you know, Okay. I try not to make analogies that like compare sports to romantic situations i try not to i feel like it's a little bit of a trite move that people wind up making however i feel like in this situation it reminds me of this one time right i had this homeboy he was dealing with somebody she wanted more of a commitment from him right common story i know she wanted more of a commitment from him so he comes to town one time and hits her up and is like hey i'm in town and she's like yeah okay great Maybe we can go to lunch, you know, because lunch in the daytime. You know what I mean? People got work to go to after. Cuts down on the complications. He was like, I ain't never laughed so hard in my life. Like, for lunch? Okay, yeah, (laughs) yeah, okay, we going to lunch. And they went to lunch, and apparently they went somewhere else, right? Why? And you know damn well that wasn't going to work, right? This idea that you're going to smoke a commitment out of somebody? No, 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 not like that. Right? Like, there might be a way that you can manage to pull it off. That one isn't going to do it. That one isn't going to pull it off. You might be able to, like, detach yourself completely, but you're not about to be awesome. Yeah, we can do that. We can go to lunch. No, 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 no. That show ain't going to work with LeBron James. LeBron, like, I don't do lunch. You know damn well you ain't trying to go to lunch with me. Cavs ain't trying to go to lunch. Cavs need to go ahead and get the biggest meal they can get tonight right they need to play reasons and just come to tr- come to terms with what the situation happens to be but you are not going to strong all lebron into nothing you ain't going to force him to say we're he's not committing to the Cavs. period well if you tell us that you're going to co- no that's not going to happen so now that you know that he is not going to commit you might just be trying to make some moves that make your team as good as it is as it could be right now i would also make the argument that i don't see a lot of ways that they can make a trade that would make this team better for the right now that would not ultimately make the team better for the future Right, like it seems like their goals kind of work together a little bit better than they're giving credit for working together right now. Cavs hustling backwards, man. Like really, really hustling backwards. If the game plan is we are going to strong arm LeBron James. Meanwhile, Kyrie over there, like somebody trade me, please. I would kind of like to go play. They're like, no, no, not, not now, Kyrie. We too busy talking to LeBron. This is why I don't want to play here, no. Kyrie, Kyrie, hey. After we talk to LeBron, then we'll talk to you. But that's what? Yeah, I know. That's why you want to leave. But you can't leave until we figure this out with LeBron. So even as Kyrie tries to assert his independence and get out from the shadow of LeBron, they're like, yeah, 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 cool, cool, cool. As soon as we figure out what we're going to do with LeBron. Yeah. And then in a couple of years, he's going to be like, man, I miss the days where they used to holler at LeBron and then talk to me. Now they talk to me first. We only won 30 games. 
888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. Coming up next, we got your phone calls. And also, the NBA thinks they have figured out how to get rid of stars resting with the schedule. I'll let you know if they pulled it off on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Sirius XM Channel 8. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. Dominique Foxworth of the Undefeated joins us next segment. Dominique Foxworth will join us at 430 Eastern, 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. And hey, top straight talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best network, no contract. All right, 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. We just talking about Kyrie Irving and the Cavs trying to get a franchise player in return for him in a trade. I don't think he's a franchise player. Let's the phone to talk to Harrison in South Carolina. Harrison, thanks for calling the right time. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm just saying, like, I feel like Kyrie is a franchise player. I mean, but so is LeBron. But, I mean, he's going to need LeBron in the long run. That's why I don't feel like he should be traded, even though cause he's saying, like, he's not a focal point. I feel like he is a focal point because if he doesn't have LeBron, um, he, if LeBron don't have him, then uh, he ain't going to have nobody to pass him. He ain't going to have anybody to pass him. Yeah, uh, thanks, Harrison, but um, I don't feel like that was that what focal point mean. Uh, let's hit the phone talk to Sean in Florida. Sean, thanks for calling the right time. All right, Bo, thanks for taking my call. Yes, sir. All right, so the issue with Kyrie going to San Antonio, they've said that he – that's one of the destinations he wants to go. I think that trading DeJounte Murray, which is a piece they would most likely be giving up, isn't smart because you would have to – it's committing over, over it's committing to Kyrie over DeJounte Murray, and with Kyrie being able to opt out after this year, I think that would be an issue. Can he opt out after this year? I thought he was in for two. I'm not sure. I think, it, I think he hasn't opt out, but he might be in for two. But either way, DeJounte Murray could be a two-way guard of the future – over Kyrie, who might not even fit in the Spurs system in the first place. Yeah, I, I think there's something to that. I appreciate the call. Anyway, DJ Mike Hitman, what's going on? Hey, Bo, let me be the GM of the Cleveland Cavaliers. They ain't got nothing to lose for, right? They know LeBron going to leave next season, and they know Kyrie ain't going to want to play for him. How about this deal? I'm trading you, whoever wants you, LeBron James, right now. I'm getting rid of you, Kyrie, and I'm going to restock my, my my team back up. I'm going to get a number one pick or somebody in the second round pick or a lottery. Why they don't just trade LeBron? They know he want to be gone and let him deal with it. Once he leaves, he can go wherever he want to go. Well, he got to know, he got, he so gotta know Mike. Mike, he got to know trade clause, man. He got to know trade clause? Yeah, Where man. Where he got to know trade clause? <laughs> he got what? He got no trade clause. I thought he, that boy was smarter than I thought he was, <laughs> with no hair. God, no. I didn't know he had no, boy, you sure he got no trade calls? I am positive. Hey, folks, if he got no trade calls, your boy get married with Stacey. I'm going to head to down there where you get married at October 1st. Have a good one, folks. All right, Mike. I love the joy that Mike had upon learning that he had no trade clause. All right, 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. And Kyrie is an unrestricted free agent in 2020. Does not have that uh, opt-out after that year. I, I, I kind of have some curiosity as to how it is that he doesn't have the opt-out. Like, I feel like his agent was asleep at the wheel there. But anyway, uh, there you go. He has no opt-out. Uh, speaking of NBA stars, they redid the NBA schedule. Basically, man, they – so – I think it winds up going well to help the players in order to rest a little better. The schedule will not be as arduous. They cut down on the four games and four nights. Um, and really, this is about the schedule, right? Like, this was a, excuse me, the national television schedule. First of all, the Warriors are going to be on national TV 43 times. 43 times. They know America know what y'all want, and y'all want the Warriors. Y'all are going to be out. They're going to be on 43 times. But here's the big thing that they're doing is that if you play in one of them national TV games, on ABC, on ABC, you will not be playing the game before or the game after. Basically, what Adam Silver is saying, these cats might not play on national television, but it ain't going to be because they're tired 
And for that, I'm like, way to go NBA. Like, what took you so long to figure out that this was probably your best move? Like, there is legitimacy to the idea that these cats need rest, right? There's legitimacy to the ideas that are behind the reason why they're missing those games. So the solution is make it to where they don't need rest for those games, right? So, yep, that's what they did. They went ahead and straightened that all the way out. They are doing everything they can to make sure that you watch these games that cost so much money. And I ain't talking about what costs so much money to the fans. I'm talking about to the games that cost so much money to ESPN. Like, you know what, fan? This sounds like the NBA was looking out for John Skipper. That's what it sounds like they were looking out for. You could be like, oh, man, I paid all this money for my kids to watch the game. Skipper paid a lot more. Might not have been Skipper's money, but Skipper paid a lot more. Skipper like, hey, 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 look here. I think you need to have LeBron out here. Me and my kids are going to be watching the game at home on television, as will all of our shareholders. Yeah, what do you know? Problem solved. Yep, good enough for me. Right? Like, I didn't really have a problem so much with all the DNP rest. And part of it is while I understand this is a league that is largely driven by stardom and the stars are the ones that most people tune in to watch, I'm, about, I'm down to watch NBA basketball, man. Like, I don't need LeBron necessarily in a game for that to be the reason that I watch it. I talk all that noise, though, but let me tell you something. LeBron ain't there. I'm probably turning the game off. I do remember this, though. And this is what I realized that people often just want something to complain about. Spurs had a game against the Heat where they pulled all their stars out, right? Like, Pop sent everybody home on a Southwest flight. And I had general problems, I admit, with the way that the Spurs handle things. Like, I feel like they milk off the publicity of the NBA, but they do not contribute at all, right? Like, they keep, they restrict everything. They be as boring as possible. They make all the money they don't put in their half. That's how I feel about it. But then Pop sent everybody home, and people are like, oh, man, we tuned in to watch the stars. I was like, you ain't tuned in to watch a Tim Duncan game one day in your life. Not once. I don't care how good Tim Duncan is. Tim Duncan is great. Ain't been a day in your life that you were like, man, I, I'm, I'm here to watch Tim Duncan. No, you weren't. Right? Like, maybe if you, you know what? It, to be fair, man, like, maybe you a coach, right? Like, you trying to run some clinic or teach something to the kids or something like that. Maybe that's the opportunity by which you was watching Tim Duncan play. You want to tune in to watch no damn Tim Duncan game. You ain't got a lot of me. You wasn't doing that. You weren't. You weren't. There's, like, really three, maybe four players in the NBA that people really are like, oh, I came to see that guy. They came to see LeBron. They came to see Durant. They came to see Steph Curry. Uh, I mean, maybe we could say Russell Westbrook, throw James Harden on that list. But otherwise, man, ain't nobody tuning in to watch nobody else. They just NBA players. They just NBA players. So, hey, they redid the whole schedule to make sure those players play, which is good because in the end, everybody else gets rest. Everybody else gets rest. What do we get? Better basketball. And I am here for better basketball. Straight Talk Wireless, nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. All right, 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. Coming up next, we'll talk to Dominique Foxworth of The Undefeated. Find out if there's anything the players can do to get some of this power back from your man, Raj. You listen to ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Series XM Channel 80. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. All guests join us on the Shell Penzo Performance Line, just like our next guest. Check him out on the morning roast, Sundays, 9 to 12 Eastern on ESPN Radio. Also check him out at theundefeated.com, where he does them good all 22s. His name is Dominique Foxworth. Dominique, I'm going to start with you. What did you think when you saw that Zeke Elliott got that six-game suspension? Yeah, I mean, I... I want to say that I was shocked, but I really wasn't shocked because you can't be shocked because you never know quite what to expect out of the league. So, uh, Ezekiel Elliott is obviously someone who has, a, at least recently, seems to have a history of making poor decisions. So, he's not someone that I'm necessarily wanting to defend. But I will say that you need some sort of consistency when you're dishing out punishments. And you need some buy-in from the players and the Players Association, which is not something that uh, the commissioner has. So, while I think a lot of people right now are happy to see, and I, I I have to say I am too happy to see that the the NFL is on the side of the victim for it seems for once but we're all happy to see this until it goes the other way which is what we're more accustomed to seeing is the commissioner having all this power and making mistakes in the decisions uh and the in the fines and the penalties that he levies. Well, I think the question there is when we see this is, okay, why is now the time that they've decided to be on the side of the victim when it seems pretty clear that they had not been previously? Like I always say about the credibility of the NFL, credibility is like insurance. You don't need insurance until you get in a wreck. Exactly. I mean, I think this is 
Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head, and they are certainly not ones that we would think of as being very credible when it comes to this. And I'm sure a lot of fan bases remember when the problem is, or part of the problem is the fan bases remember when they are on the wrong side of this, and then rather than stand up when they see it go wrong again, they just celebrate. Ha ha! Now you're getting it, and that's not the that's not the right way I think to to react when something like this happens. So again, Zeke is not someone that any of us wants to defend, but you're either on the side side of doing the process right all the time or on the side of just kind of knee-jerk reacting to any uh, the the latest trans- transgression. And I try my best not to let my emotions get involved in the league, let their emotions get involved, unfortunately. So it, it kind of feels that Ezekiel Elliott is picking up some of, some of the punishment for all the mistakes that Goodell has made in the past with uh, levying penalties. All right, talking to Dominique Foxworth of ESPN Radio on the Undefeated here on the right time. Now, you were working with the Players Association when this CBA was done, and I've always wondered, how in the world was it allowed that Roger Goodell got to be the guy to hear the appeal? Yeah, no, I mean, I, it's certainly not my proudest moment, but I, I think that there's, I mean, we talked before about the piece that I wrote about decertification of the union because there really is a severe power asymmetry, and it's not much the players can do. If you ask the players to go on strike for something like this, it's unrealistic to ask all the players to go on strike when no player, until they are caught, caught up in this um, situation, no player ever thinks they're going to end up on the wrong side of it. And I think Tom Brady is a perfect example. I can guarantee you during the last CBA negotiations, Tom Tom Brady never thought he was going to end up on the wrong side of commissioner discipline, but no one thinks they're going to end up on the wrong side of it until they are. And another difficult thing is this is core in the, in the NFL's mind. This is core to their revenue generating strategy and they need to be able to punish guys. So it's not, so it doesn't appear that they are coddling criminals, frankly, because if it appears that way, then those billions of dollars in sponsorships go away. So I don't know if we went on strike for 10 years, I'm not sure that, the league would ever um, give way to that particular demand because they feel like if they lose that, then they lose access to billions of dollars. Well, and also, we're talking Dominique Foxworth at the undefeated. I guess the thing that's tricky for me about this is they could still have power, just a neutral arbitrator, one would think, right? Like the three-person body like you have, you know, in the other sports and within the NFL on some measures. No, I would agree with you, and that'd be fine. But then they would lose complete power. So I don't think, in their mind, the court or in their mind, public opinion matters. And whether a player gets back on the field too soon because of an appeal, or a player gets back on the field too soon because they made a poor decision, it doesn't matter. If it, if the perception to them or the per- perception to potential sponsors is that there are a lot of criminals in the NFL, then that lowers their value to those sponsors. So I don't think they care whether it's fair or not fair, and I don't think they care whether the player gets back on the field because of appeal or not. They want it to be very clear to Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Under Armour and anybody else who wants to associate with them. They want it to be very clear that this is a league that is clean and pure. And, I mean, the irony in that is very, very palpable, thinking of their history with concussions. We're going to talk to Dominique Foxworth of the Undefeated here on the right time, I want to switch gears to your all twenty two. You telling people how to dominate over Brad, man. Who's Brad? <laughs> I don't know. I needed a nice random name that people everyone could imagine somebody that deserves to be dominated. So I picked Brad out. Everyone's coming to me asking, like, was I bullied by some dude named Brad? A, I've never been bullied. And B, I certainly wouldn't let no dude named Brad do it. But I figured like when you are in the office and or the barbershop is where I have this occurrence mostly, and there's somebody in there who's talking about football, regurgitating all the stuff they heard on TV but don't actually know what they're talking about, it's really annoying. So I'm giving people some little tidbits, some deep insights, so when they get in those situations, they can really dominate and know what they're talking about. Do you realize you're creating more Brads by doing this? <laughs> I know that. I know that, but I'm, I'm creating informed Brads. This is better than aggressively ignorant Brad. That's a problem. When I'm in a barbershop, I've never told anybody. I had to switch barbershops because they once found out that I used to play in the NFL and I worked on ESPN, but I had to switch barbershops. When I'm in there, it is just so painful listening to people yell and scream so aggressively like they know what they're talking about, and they have no clue. So I'm doing my part to inform the public. If they want to use it in a condescending manner, that's on them. But at least they won't be sounding dumb. You know, I was in a very similar situation. That's why I stopped going to the barbershop. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, you're, like, real legit famous now. I don't know. You have to have the barber come to you at this point, yeah. right? Well, I mean, I don't really have to go to the barber anymore. But that was, like, Fair. part of it. Like, when I moved to Miami, I was like, look, I'm not going through this in a new barbershop. Right? Like, I used to go to the old barbershop at 8 o'clock in the morning trying to get in and out as quickly as possible to avoid those very moments of discussion. 
Yeah, I agree with you, but it's they once they figured it out, then they wanted to ask me and they wanted me to co sign on their foolishness and then it's like if they at least started at a place of reasonable understanding I could join in the conversation. But I had to spend three hours there getting them to a reasonable baseline before I can even explain to them what's actually happening. So now I have a, a link to send to them when they start getting on my nerves. What was the most annoying thing you hear people say where you're just like, Oh God, you don't know what's going on? Nah, I think one of the things that bothers me most is how so many offensive coordinators are so flawed, and rather than anyone spend the time understanding what's happening, they just say the quarterback sucks or this player is terrible. And I think there's a lot of coordinators who aren't giving, giving guys a chance because they aren't uh, scheming up the defenses in a way that's very helpful. They're just lazy. They're like, this is what works for me. This is what we're going to run. And, uh, I mean, one of the dirty secrets is some of the best quarterbacks in the NFL are not reading through their progression during the play. They're doing motions and shifts to figure out what the defense is doing, and they know where they're throwing the ball before they throw the ball. And I see so often that people are, are – offensive coordinators are asking young quarterbacks to actually read during the play and not set them up for success, and it bothers me because the reflex is quarterback sucks. I got one quarterback I can immediately think of that I know <laughs> doesn't read nothing. First guy he's looking at every single time he's throwing the ball to, but they get mad at me when I say that, so I ain't even going to bring up his name. You know who I'm talking about, though. <laughs> I do know who you're talking about, but... And am I, mean, I right, I by the way? Am I right? Whether you're right or wrong doesn't necessarily I'm just, matter. I'm because just I curious. Think Peyton Manning is a quarterback that rarely, in the course of an actual play, was he reading. He would motion and shift and figure out what you were in, and then he would know where he's throwing the ball. He would look off and then throw it where it was supposed to go. So I think reading the, through your progressions during a play is just... As a, as a matter of skill, is overrated. It's much more important to be able to manipulate and read pre-snap than it is during the play because no one can consistently read an entire defense in less than a second, every single play down the field, not even Tom Brady. For what it's worth, that's part of why Peyton Manning wasn't so great in the postseason. The, the okie doke is in full Peyton. effect. You know, dude, <laughs> dude. I mean, this is the thing about Peyton Manning. We talked to Dominique Foxworth of uh, ESPN Radio here on The Right Time. Um, the thing with him is, we knew this, they were running the same small handful of plays, right? They just ran right. them so well that nobody could do anything. Then in the playoffs, people start doing something a little bit different. He's like, oh, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be there. That's fair. That's fair. But I, I don't think, I think that he was part of, in the same way that we look at uh, quarterbacks who are athletic and say that their development is hindered by the fact that they are leaning on their athleticism, I think the same is partially true for Peyton Manning is because he became the offensive coordinator. And so once he, be, for many teams, when he became an offensive coordinator and then he got into the playoffs and was facing real legitimate defensive coordinators who were putting a lot more time and effort into preparing for him, I think he was a little shorthanded because then he was like, well, we're just going to run the same thing we've been running. I mean, I can't be, I can't criticize Peyton too much because they did beat us when I was in the playoffs. <laughs> you are right, though. That is the one thing that you're not, you're not supposed to be the coach. If coaching and playing were that easy, they still have all the quarterbacks calling their plays. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there should be a healthy collaboration between the coaches and the quarterbacks. But, I mean, you read so often about coaches who are spending the night in – in their offices and working up all these complicated schemes. Peyton was trying to do that and also throw the football, which is asking a bit much. I would agree there. That's Dominique Foxworth. Check him out on the undefeated.com. Also the morning roast, 9 to 12 Eastern on ESPN Radio with Clinton Yates and Mina Kimes. My man, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Always. Thank you. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. All guests join us on the Shell Penzo Performance Line. Thanks, Dominique Foxworth of the Undefeated for joining us the last segment. Jim Trotter of ESPN will join us in the 5 o'clock Eastern hour. And right now, on hour 22 of the ESPN Fantasy Football Marathon, our man, Mike Golick Jr. How how, how you feeling, bro? Uh, Bo, it's touch and go right now, man. Uh, Starting to hit that wall a little bit again. And uh, it's... It's more time. I mean, this is the second time me and Sarah Spain have ever hung out, so you're learning a lot about two people in one setting like this. Is that a good thing? Uh, it's a good thing for me because Sarah's great. I don't know if it's as good the other way around just because, you know, my uh, – at 22 hours in, hygiene and all these things kind of take a back seat. So she's got to deal with some things that I don't think she's dealing with at home. Yeah, and you got dunked in the water. I saw that where she put you in the dunk, in, in the dunk tank. Like, 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 I mean, so what was worse, hitting the wall or hitting that water? In front of all your colleagues at the cafeteria. Honestly, hitting the water helped, man. That was just like an extra shot of caffeine for me. Like, that was one less coffee I had to drink because I got woken up in the middle of the day. And it was a little bit off-putting. Like, I was off-balance being out there in swim trunks and a tank top 
in front of like all our coworkers and some of my bosses, like all that stuff where I was like, this feels like I might be pushing the line a little bit too far, even 20 hours in. We're talking to Mike Golick Jr. here on uh, The Right Time. And I feel like that actually, though, for you was a great audition video for the Levitar show. No, it really is. That's kind of how I treat everything, basically, is just trying to earn trips back down to Miami. Like, I've hit a little bit of a drought here since Dominique and Mina came into the picture, and they've gone down and been really interesting and been great. So i got to start up in the ante now and just doing wild stuff to make sure I can get back to South Beach. Yeah, see, the problem you got there, man, is two guys. I know y'all do that weekend show together. You might be trying to keep you away in the name of protecting this turf. No, I, I, that's the thing, too, is, like, I it, we kind of set it up when I went down there the first couple of times is, you know, Dan's away and Stu Gatz brought me into their marital bed and it was all this stuff. <laughs> and now I'm realizing that I've just become a compartmentalized side chick in my own right. So it's a, it's a sobering <laughs> thing to come to grips with. <laughs> Under Mike Golden Jr. Uh, of ESPN on this year Fantasy Football Marathon. I hate to keep you, but this is going so well. So I feel like, do you have, like, any fantasy tips? Fantasy tips, you know what, that's the thing, man, is we haven't really been asked to dole out fantasy advice, so I can give you some, like I can talk about the fact that it's a deep quarterback class outside of those top four guys, like I can talk about that it was a renaissance year last year for a lot of the running back groups coming in, I can talk about how much I like Dalvin Cook coming out of this year's rookie running back class, like of all these guys with him and Fournette and McCaffrey, I feel like Dalvin Cook is going to be in a unique position just because Minnesota's kind of retooled that offense and got a cool shot to actually be something in that division. But these are all the takes that have just been kind of sitting dormant because we're basically just a sideshow over here. It's wild. So basically you studied for nothing. Oh, yeah, no. Like I had stuff printed out. I was highlighting. I was looking things up. I was getting it all ready to go. And then we get here and they're like, oh, yeah, it's you and Sarah road tripping to Fantasy Island. And we have been asked exactly no fantasy questions, no half point PPR, pick three out of five, none of that. Like we have been utterly useless in that regard. So basically they made you stew guys and didn't tell you before you got there. Yeah, more or less, more or less. That's a pretty uh, succinct way of putting it. Yeah, he makes a good money. Maybe your time will come. Mike Golick Jr., check him out. How many? You got two more hours? Two more hours. Uh, actually, no, we're going through the end. What am I talking about? We'll be done at 11. Keep the faith, man. Keep the faith. Appreciate it, Bo. <laughs> All right, man, you take it easy. Uh, the Fantasy Football Marathon is brought to you by DraftKings, by the way, 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. And, hey, guys, I know the one thing that a lot of you learned during this Fantasy Marathon. You know what that is? You learned what an auction draft was. Yeah. A lot of people didn't know what an auction draft was until today, until they turned the channel. And they're like, what the hell is that? It's an auction draft. It's this thing where in the fantasy league, instead of just picking players, you kind of bid in order to get to players. It can just look uncomfortable if you, like, look at it at the wrong time, and it looks like they're bidding on people. And I'm just curious here because, like, I'm a person who doesn't, like, watch a lot of movies, right? But I went to see Get Out. And I had been reading that Get Out made something like $170 million at the box office, which implies that a whole lot of people had seen Get Out. And I was just curious, um, did they show Get Out at, like, any of the theaters in Connecticut? Because, like, I feel like sometimes you see something, you'd be like, you know what, that reminds me of a scene from a movie. Apparently not. I didn't, that didn't. That's not. It didn't go that way this time. Like I think we're just gonna act like that whole thing didn't happen. But like a whole lot of people are not really like acting like this thing didn't happen. I would just tell you if you are one of those people, go 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 check out what an auction draft is. And I feel like when you see what an auction draft was, you can see how it is that somebody would say, "Hey, you know what? Let's go ahead and put our auction draft on television." Now maybe somebody should have been like, "Hey." Maybe we should configure this auction draft uh, just, just just a little bit differently, right? Right, right? Because the danger always comes up with if somebody tunes in in the middle of the segment, you never know what it is that they're going to be talking about. I have a fascinating story that my father tells about one of his friends being at the Democratic National Convention. And while people were talking, they were having a conversation about the war in Vietnam. And then he fell asleep. And when he woke up, they were having a discussion about gays in the military. And that led to him to think that two ideas had been put together in an erroneous way. And he uttered something that I cannot say on the radio. All I'm saying is sometimes people fall asleep, wake up, and in the middle. And the next thing you know, it's Antonio Brown and people bidding on him. But it was an auction draft. Just an auction draft. With horrific optics.
Anyway, look at what an uh, just look at what an auction draft is. I think you'll understand. 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. Coming up next, people talking about the Patriots going undefeated. Why are they doing that? ESPN Radio. Thanks for listening to the Right Time Podcast. Please come back tomorrow for more. And don't forget to listen to The Right Time with Bomani Jones from 4 p.m. to 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Daddy, where do babies come from? Uh, well, uh... Honey? Mommy went to the store. Oh, well, you see, um, well, there's a mommy and a daddy, right? Right. And see, when they call Geico, uh, they could save a bunch of money on car insurance. Oh, really? And that makes them happy? Yes, that makes them very happy. That's good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we could have this talk, sunshine. (laughs) Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Welcome to the Right Time Podcast. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. You can send us a tweet at the 1-800-Flowers.com Twitter feed. That is at Bomani underscore Jones. So a lot of people have been talking about the Patriots in the context of going 16-0. and 0. People see this as a Patriots team that could wind up going undefeated right now of course that's a lot to ask out of any team but uh tom brady did an appearance on his favorite radio show on weei yeah so um anyway here is tom brady talking about what it is what what he what he thinks about when he hears about these 16 and 0 sorts of comparisons for this team i mean we need to be focused on so many other things than what people may think about us there's so much improvement we need to make You know, I love the guys that I'm playing with this year. This is a totally different version of a team that we've had. We'll have our own strengths and weaknesses, but, you know, how the season plays out will be determined by what happens moving forward. And you're talking about some magical years that we've had that may never be duplicated again. So it's really unfair to compare any of that to what's happened in the past. All right, man. Here we go. He's right. He is absolutely right. This idea that this team, that you look at it and say to yourself, this is a team that is going to go 16-0. and I think that you're asking for a lot here of this team or basically any other team. Now, I have dismissed this, but you know what I didn't fully realize until now? They went 14-2 to last year. One of those losses with Jacoby Brissett basically playing with one arm. Um, I get why you would go there. But no, 16-0 and is too much to ask of any team. Now, my thing about the Patriots is I did not think that they were a great team last year I thought they were a team with a very good record and by the way a team that gets a kind of sort of advantage baked in from you know playing in the AFC East which is basically like writing down six wins although last year they only got to write down five of them I don't see this and just think oh my god this is such a great team I think they are a very good offensive team I don't think of them really as being a great offensive team I think of them as a very good defensive team I don't really think of them as a great defensive team like I just don't I don't see greatness and when we're talking about 16 and 0 off the jump I feel like we should probably be talking about greatness also do you believe that they're going to go through all next season with a passing game that throws two interceptions did you realize that as as a staff label as a fragrant crew the Patriots threw two interceptions last year like I was looking at this to make sure it wasn't ranks yes two interceptions last year Yeah, that's pretty impressive. By the way, speaking of impressive, ESPN Fantasy Football Marathon is currently going on, so make sure you, A, sign up and play on ESPN.com or in the ESPN Fantasy app. Play in a private league with friends or join a public league and be matched with other ESPN fans. Play in 25 leagues, completely free, Fantasy Football Marathon, presented by DraftKings. Hey, man, you got to do that sometimes. Anyway, uh, no, I... I just don't see undefeated here necessarily. Now, I do think, like, adding Brandon Cooks helps, certainly. And I think he helps because your go-to receiver was Gronk, right? Like, granted, they did well with Gronk not being in there, but your go-to threaten you receiver was Gronk. Brandon Cooks, okay, that makes things a little bit better. It does. Like, I do think it makes things a better move for them. Okay, you'd like to have that. We're still going a long way asking for 16 and no. Now, if you'll excuse me, I think I'm about to embarrass somebody. 888-729-3776. So to Garrett in North Carolina. Garrett, sup? Hey, Bo. Listen, man, I, I love you, man. I love the show. 
But I remember having this conversation with you last year, and it's always a little you had a, bit hold of hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You, hold on. You had this conversation with me about them going 16-0? and no, no, no. Just just about them winning the Super Bowl last year. Okay. And um I didn't think they know, were gonna I didn't think they were gonna win the Super Bowl. Now I'm saying right. I don't think they'll go sixteen and oh. That's not a bold and that's, statement. And listen, that's a, no, no, no. And that's a valid point. I mean you still need a lot of things to happen. Then why are you about to waste my time? Well, because because I'm telling you that they can if they stay healthy. If they stay healthy, they do can you, definitely do go you realize do you realize what a if that is in the NFL? If you can stay healthy while your dudes are getting hit in the head. It's a, it's a big, it's a big if. I understand that. If saying, if was a fifth, we'd all be drunk, Garrett. I Why it, are I you wasting my time? The point was that the, the Patriots, you didn't think them that they got that good of a team. They are that good of a team, Bo. It's just that they don't have a headliner. They don't, outside of Tom Brady and Gronkowski, who's always hurt. Right, they don't have that superstar that you can sit there and say, "Oh, this is a great team." But they are because they're fundamentally sound. They do everything fundamentally sound. right when they're on the fundamentally field. Sound. Fundamentally okay. sound. You talking yeah. about the receipt? You talking about the receivers? You talking about the San Antonio Spurs? Uh, of you talking about the receivers? You talking about, about the fundamentally sound receivers? I'm talking about those fundamentally sound receivers that always get open. I'm talking about that fundamentally sound receiver named Hogan to have with 20 yards receiving. I'm talking about that Julian Edelman who people keep saying he's only five foot five, but he continues to make big plays. That's what I'm talking about, Bo. Them players that you keep underestimating and they keep showing up. Thank you for having the temerity to stand up for the Patriots. I don't know what you want from me here. I don't, I don't know what you want. Like the Patriots are coming. I mean, look, I've been here for the last 16, 17 years. It's not a question of how good the Patriots are. It's a question of uh, today. Do you think they will go 16-0? and They ain't made an NFL team yet that I'm betting on off the rip going 16-0. and Not one. I don't think that's absurd. I just don't, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. Let's go ahead and throw Greg in St. Louis all new, though. Greg, that's a call to the right time. Greg. Oh, okay. Um, number one, that last caller, are you insane? This is football. It's a contact sport. You cannot if everyone stays healthy. Uh, the, other, the other reason for the call was there was an article on the undefeated that was written by Stephen A. Smith. And I just have one question, and I'm going to get off the line, and hopefully you can answer it for me. In football, it's all about the team buying in and believing that the organization is doing everything it can to put them in the best possible position to win. There is no way in hell you're going to tell me that these teams with, that with these quarterback battles all have a better option than Colin Kaepernick. And with that, I'm going to get off the line. Love the show. Thank you so much. Appreciate your insight. I appreciate it, man. Um, I didn't read that Stephen A. column, so I can't really say anything um, about that. I would also say, though, that, yes, your point is correct there about Kaepernick. Um, I'm kind of done with that particular fight, though. And when I say I'm done with that fight, I mean there's nothing left for me to say about this. Kaepernick is better than dudes that have jobs. What we have going on as it relates to him is not a football issue. Like, I don't think any of those things at this point are really disputable. And given that I don't think any of those things at this point are disputable, um, I don't know, like, what it is that's going to come of it for me arguing the point. You know how I feel about it. In fact, I feel like you know what it is that's going on here. The league has made their call. There's really nothing I can do in that regard. So it's not as though, like, now I don't care about the issue as it relates to Kaepernick. I just look at it like, yeah, okay. All these teams, every time a team signs a quarterback and the quarterback isn't as good as Kaepernick, I could absolutely be like, yeah, but what about Colin Kaepernick? But y'all know that already. The people who are there have made the decision. They don't really care about that. They don't care about it at all. And I honestly find myself left in a place where I'm confused as to how exactly I should handle it. And where I say I'm confused as to how I should handle it is, I don't know if there's anything productive for me to say about it at this point. These jokers are going to do what they do. Now, what I would like is for people to just be honest about what the situation is turned into. Like, that would be my request, is that others be real about what it is that is going on. But, yeah, you're right. You're not going to be able to tell me that all these scrubs are getting jobs and that Kaepernick isn't good enough to get one of those jobs. We're just at a point now where one thing you're going to learn about people who make decisions like the one that's being made about Kaepernick, after you catch them in the lie, it's not like they say, okay, you got me. Once you catch them in the lie, you know what they do? 
they realize they probably didn't have to tell the lie in the first place. And they just keep it moving. Sad but true. All right, 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. Coming up next, the NFL says they will not release their report on Ezekiel Elliott. I'll tell you why that's hustling backwards on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Sirius XM Channel Lady. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. Jim Trotter of ESPN will join us next segment. Jim Trotter will join us at 5.30 Eastern. Nothing makes a summer birthday or anniversary more magical than 1-800-Flowers.com. Right now, when you order a dozen multicolored roses for only twenty nine ninety nine, you get another dozen absolutely free. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash ESPN. 888-729-3776. That's the number that's to Daniel in Chicago. Daniel, thanks for calling the right time. Daniel. Daniel. All right, Dan. 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. So Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk, put a post up that I thought was worth checking. Where he says, look, man, the NFL will not release the investigative report from their uh, from the Ezekiel Elliott situation, nor will they release a transcript of the hearing. Now, what Florio says here, and I quote, We've learned in recent years that the NFL's version of the truth in matters of discipline may not always square entirely with the truth, given the apparent habit of selecting an outcome and working backwards to justify it. And so it's impossible in this case to conclude that the contents of the NFL's public statement or its letter to Elliott explaining the suspension represent the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Eventually, more evidence will emerge that will equip the jurors in the court of public opinion to get the truth or at least formulate reasonable or unreasonable opinions about it. For now, the NFL has declined to release publicly information that would shed plenty of light on whether Elliott is guilty of domestic violence. The 160-page investigative report, more than 100 exhibits, and the transcript of the June 26 hearing. It is interesting, though, that we are willing to take the NFL's word on a lot of this when we really don't know anything of what it is that they have. And see, this is one thing the NFL always has going for it, is that no matter how much we can get into these discussions about how the NFL has questionable credibility, they still, all they got to do is shine it up just a little bit and win a press conference. And we're like, nope, I think the NFL finally got this one right. Like basically, what we did with this Zeke Elliott uh, situation is the virtual equivalent of being like, you know, the commissioner looks real commissionery, kind of like look at presidential. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, he, he really sounds like a commissioner this time, as if his damn job ain't sounding like a commissioner. Like, that's not what he's supposed to do every single day. Like, that's where we are on this one when it comes to Zeke. Maybe you could take their word for it, right? Like, maybe, maybe, maybe you can't. But how in the world could you do that? And again, Zeke's people are coming so hard on this one that it is fair to wonder, like, how are you so confident in this? Because if it's a lie, man, you go wind up looking bad, 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 bad. Now, if I had to ask a question, no matter what the circumstance is, who do I think is more willing to fight on a lie, the NFL or whoever the NFL is dealing with? Ain't a lot of people I'm going to take um, the other side on over the NFL. The NFL has demonstrated they will fight on that lie. Once that lie has been determined, they will fight on that lie. It's one of the charming things I, supp- I about them, I suppose. Their willingness to fight on that lie. Are they fighting on a lie? I don't know. Now, this is my man uh, Clarence Hill, the Fort Worth Star Telegram. He's talking to Izzy in Spain. Here's what he had to say. We got a point. Yeah, there we go. There is a police thinking in the Cowboys camp and Z's camp that they went too far trying to get right for the public, and they've made a scapegoat out of Elliott here because they didn't really have the stuff to, to do this. Of course, certainly Jerry Jones doesn't think, when he looked at all the, the evidence and investigations, that there was enough there for a suspension at all, let alone a fifth game suspension. And the thing that is scary for players is that so someone can make an accusation against you, and the league is going to side with her over you and can basically extort you to say, I'm not going to, you know, if you don't give me this, then I'll call the cops and or call the league. You know, there's a hotline of people who call for the league and, and make complaints against you, and if the league is going to, going to side with, with accuser without conviction, you know, you're setting up a slippery slope that allows players to be extorted. Now, I have to say that I worry about any time that the argument gets to they're going to be setting us up, right? Like, I, I, that, that worries me. That's always a tricky one because it ain't that many people who are playing the game and running the setup. Now, the thing I always say about this is this argument we target to people like, yeah, it makes women look bad. 
I would not make to say that these dudes are targets necessarily, but if anybody's a target, the dude with a pocket full of money and in the situation they're in would wind up being there. Now, is this really going to be a thing where a woman can suddenly just extort an NFL player because of this? I feel like that is a bit of an extremity. I also don't know from here why it is that the Cowboys and everybody on that side is so certain that this is nonsensical. The NFL is really behaving as though this is a thing. I just don't have any way to believe anybody on either side of this. There is no one on either side of this that I have any measure of trust for. Now, the other thing the NFL has got to answer, and I do think that this becomes a thing, is when you've had cats where it was open and shut and you knew that there was an incidence of domestic violence, you gave them some credit for, okay, well, you know, these guys, you know, insert person here has seen the error of their ways. It'll never happen again. They'll never do it again. Josh Brown winds up being the example that you have. And that's what they decided to ride out for. you got to have some measure of consistency in your processes. Like, no matter what it is that you do, there has to be some level of consistency in your processes. And this is the part that the NFL just seems to be totally, like, indifferent to, is any measure of consistency within their processes. The reason that they don't really have to have consistency in their processes, they're willing to let these things go to arbitrators, and if the arbitrators decide to throw the suspension out or whatever, they're willing to do that. But part of why they don't have to have any consistency in their processes is we will pat them on the head in a moment like this one with Zeke. They don't have to have consistency in their processes, if the one time they get somebody a minimum, a minimum, what was supposed to be the minimum punishment, we're like, hey, great job on finally coming down when that was supposed to be the minimum. And when they had that press conference about the minimum, you were like, hey, great job. Finally, we got a minimum, even though there were so many levels of flaw in that decision. No, nah, man, they do this stuff because we allow them to get away with it. Because when they get wrong, all we do is scream. And when they get it not even right, if it smells right. Right. Just just a little bit of just a little whiff of right. Like it's not like got paprika in it. Good enough. Boom. You're there. That's all you need. That's all you need. And you wonder why we keep on lying to us in various ways. And like right now, I don't know. Maybe they wasn't lying. Right. Like that's possible. Maybe the NFL is not lying about this. I just don't know if I'll ever be in a situation where I'm willing to be the one to definitively say, oh, come on, man. They wouldn't lie about something like that. Word. For real. You sure about that? So I feel like if you're the NFL, you kind of got to put this stuff out there, except for the fact that if you're the NFL, you don't have to put anything out because they never got to explain themselves. They never have to defend anything. By the same token, though, there's noise that Zeke's out here talking. You got to put some stuff out here, too. Right. You got to put some stuff out here, too. Everybody's on show and prove. Every single one of them is on show and prove, except none of them really feel like they have to show or prove. Somebody, I figure, though, is probably going to go first. The leak game is going to begin. Generally speaking, if you're going to play the leak game, you kind of want to be the one to get out in front of it. So maybe the NFL is just like, whatever. Or the NFL is going to let this get bad. And you know what happens if this gets bad? That's right. Your man Adolfo is going to be all Mike and Mike. Adolfo or uh, Troy Vincent. Those are the two dudes where the garage is like, ooh, this looks impossible. Hey, Adolfo. Are you doing anything tomorrow morning at 6.45? Yeah, I know it's early, but, uh, you know, that thing we like to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell Greeny I said what's happening. Uh, By the way, just to switch gears just a little bit, because we had a phone call I thought I was going to be able to take, but we could not. I just saw something on the bottom line that says somebody from the Jets says that Christian Hackenberg is, quote, like a rookie, unquote, and there's no way to know if he is ready to start a regular season game. And Todd Bowles. I mean, are you renting? Like, I hope you're renting. If you're not renting, go ahead and sell. Right, just go ahead. Like, I feel like you go ahead and put that on the market. I know it can be very inconvenient to try to go through a move while you got a season going on, whatever it is. I totally understand that. But if I were you, i start scoping out my options right now and getting the hell out of Dodge because uh, they scope. Like, they, I don't know if you're renting your house, but they are definitely renting you as the head coach. Yeah, it ain't a buying situation. All right, 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. Coming up next is Silas with Colin Kaepernick becoming an issue with players who support him. What's up to Jim Trotter at ESPN on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Sirius XM Channel 80. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. 
All guests join us on the Shell Penzo Performance Line, just like our next guest covers the NFL for us here at ESPN. His name is Jim Trotter. Now, Jim, I talked to you a couple weeks ago after you had spoken with Jerry Jones, and he felt there was no evidence against Ezekiel Elliott. So what were your thoughts when you saw the six-game suspension came down? Uh, I was surprised at the length of it, to be honest with you. One, because the NFL has been so inconsistent in, in how it's meted out punishment under its domestic violence policy. You know, my thing is that if, if Josh Brown could get one game, then then um, for Zeke to get six, it just seemed uh, a little inconsistent. But I'll say this to you, Bomani. We've heard one side in this story, and that's that's the league side. And I will say to you that if everything the league alleges in the letter that it sent out to Ezekiel Elliott is true, referring to the three different occasions of, of domestic violence, then to my to, to me, the league didn't go far enough. If all of those things are true, he should have been suspended for the year. I believe the league should have a zero tolerance on domestic violence as well as drinking and driving. And the reality is under its domestic violence policy, it says that the six games is the baseline in terms of punishment, and it can be lessened or increased depending on mitigating circumstances. And if everything in that letter is true in terms of what Ezekiel Elliott did or is alleged to have done, then to me it should have been more than six games. Well, does the six games mean anything at this point? Because this is the first time I think we've had the six games. I'm not sure if it's the first. We, we've gone back and forth with this internally about whether or not it is or it isn't. But I'll say this to you. No, it, it doesn't mean anything at this point. I know some people are trying to say this is a watershed moment potentially, that this is now going to be the new framework for the league going forward and all these kinds of things. Look, the reality is here we're probably headed back to court, just like we were on some of these other cases. So I'm not sure what's going on here. And, again, when we hear from Zeke's side, um, now that could change the narrative any, uh, even more in terms of what they're going to allege about the evidence as presented by the league. So, again, I make this case. If everything that the league alleges is true in that letter, then it should have been a lot more than six games. All right, we're talking to Jim Trotter of ESPN here on The Right Time. Now, we talked to Dominique Foxworth a little earlier who was working with the Players Association when they negotiated the CBA that not only gave Goodell the power to give discipline but also allowed Goodell to oversee the appeals. Correct. Is there any chance Correct. that the players in any, C- <laughs> in any negotiation could ever get that back? Absolutely, and I can tell you this. that there, there was discussion, I believe it was a couple of years ago, between the union and the league, and the union actually thought that Goodell was giving in on on um, uh, the appeal hearing of being judge, jury, and executioner. And, and the union thought it had an agreement with Goodell, and then all of a sudden it changed when Goodell got back to New York. There had been a conversation between Goodell and DeMora Smith about this. They had been talking for some time. And what I believe, and this is just a supposition on my part, what happened is when De- Goodell got back and he presented that to the attorneys there, they said, why would we give this away for free? This is something we can get something out of this in collective bargaining, and therefore it didn't go forward. And I believe that once we get to the new collective bargain, the the new um, collective bargaining negotiations, that's one of the things that the league will be willing to give up is having Goodell as the final arbiter in terms of uh, of these cases. Now, if you're the league, why would you be willing to give it up? Is it just the bad PR that comes when these things go wrong? Absolutely, absolutely. How many times have we seen Goodell get beaten up? over making decisions that none of us could wrap our heads around. And so for some owners I know that I've talked to, they said, why do we want to continue with that? Why not let an independent arbiter, you know, who has some sort of ties to the NFL, um, why not let that person make the decision? And then in some ways it gives the commissioner some, some breathing room. But there's a lot of hubris when it comes to Roger Goodell, as you know, and he likes being viewed as the enforcer. That's why he stood under that Time um, um, magazine you know, headline where it called him the enforcer. He likes that. But there are owners in the league who believe it's not in the league's best interest necessarily to have him as that guy, you know, the final arbiter in these cases. I'm talking to Jim Trotter of ESPN here on The Right Time. Now, is there any danger for Goodell in running afoul of Jerry Jones? No, I don't think so. Because look at this. He took on Robert Kraft, and, and behind the scenes there were a number of owners who wanted him to discipline the Patriots. And now he's got Jerry Jones, and I can tell you for a fact that there are a number of owners who want the Cowboys to be disciplined in this. Roger Goodell is nothing if not a a political creature who understands the landscape in terms of his owners. And therefore, in my mind, he would not be proceeding in this way if if he did not feel he had the backing of the owner. So, no, I don't think he's in any danger. Is he going to make Jerry upset? Of course he is. Jerry was upset also when he got the, 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 the fine for violating the 
non-salary cap, if you will, um, agreement or, or instructions during the, the uh, uncapped year. So, no, I, Jerry won't be happy, but I don't think it's going to impact Roger at all. All right, talking to Jim Trotter, ESPN, here on the right time. Switching gears, saw you tweeting about this, that there are some players who would like to hear from Kyle and Kaepernick, players who have been supportive of his cause. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, it, it really comes down to this, because I had been kind of beating the drums that what, why are more players standing up for Colin Kaepernick right now? And when I started asking players who, were, who have been supportive publicly of Colin, you know, I was a little surprised, but they said to me, um, how do you stand up for a guy who's not standing up for, for himself? There's only so much we can do because as, as it is now, if they continue, keep continuing to speak out, it appears that they care more about Colin's future than Colin does. And so they were saying, we would like to hear from Colin. We would like to hear him say what his objective is going forward. We know the reason behind the protest, and we support him on that. But now when it comes to him not being signed, what's the best strategy going forward? What's his end game? What's the objective? And they have not heard that from him. And the one thing they've done when some of them have spoken to him and they've asked him about it is he has thanked them for their support, but he is not giving them any direction in terms of what they could do to help him or what he plans to do. So they have said to me that they would like to hear from him publicly, you know, and they are willing to stand alongside of him, but he just has not been willing to do that at this point. Now, were you surprised to see how outspoken Michael Bennett? I mean, I guess it's no surprise to see a Michael Bennett be outspoken on this, but I guess it was interesting that now was the time that he chose to approach this this way. You know, I wasn't surprised at all, but my, to, to be serious, um, if you look at this offseason with Michael Bennett, he's been more and more vocal about things that have been going on. And Michael and his brother Martellus are two of the more socially conscious players in the NFL. I mean, they do speak out on issues, and, and they have these great personalities, and sometimes people – you know, um, get caught up in that as opposed to, to seeing just how serious they are about some of these issues. And so if you have followed Michael this offseason, you have seen different points where he has spoken out on certain things. So to take this step, um, it didn't surprise me at all. It surprised me a little bit that he didn't consult with anyone. He didn't talk with any teammates about it. You know, he did it on his own. And, and in fact, after the game, Pete Carroll was surprised by it. The front office was surprised and even his teammates. But they also supported him on it because they know how serious he is about it. And, you know, I respect him for that. I, I respect any player who stands up and speaks out on these issues. And when I asked Michael if he's going to continue to do this, um, to sit during the season, he said yes. So, um, so no, I wasn't surprised that he did it. Uh, and I think we're going to see more players, once the season get, gets here, uh, make some sort of statement. Now, I'm not saying they're going to sit, but it could be anything. Um, you know, whether it's another, it's a raised fist again, whether or not it, it's messages they might put on cleats, whatever. I do think we're going to hear from players during the season. Now, do you think anybody will be able to get Marshawn Lynch to talk about this? <laughs> I think you know the answer to that. <laughs> no, no, no. It would be something, but no, I, I don't think we're going to get him to speak on it. And that's what was so fascinating to me about Marshawn's situation because Jack Del Rio, who was so critical of Colin last year in terms of taking a knee and everything else, now when his one of his players does it, he says, well, Marshawn told me that it, it wasn't about anything political, that he had been doing this for 11 years. And then you see the, the, the video and the, and the pictures that show otherwise, that there were times he sat, but there were other times he stood. So, But Jack was willing to accept him at his word on that instead of coming down hard on, on Marshawn. Now, is that just because Marshawn's a talented player? who can help Jack get to where he wants to get to? Or was it also because the owner has once described Tommy Smith as one of his heroes and, and even invited Tommy Smith to light the, the, the Al Davis torch for the Raiders game down in Mexico City where, where um, Tommy Smith raised his fist? So it's interesting to me how people change their opinions or something depending on the situation that they're in. All right, that's Jim Trotter. Check him out covering the NFL for us here at ESPN. Thanks so much, my man. I appreciate it. Appreciate you having me. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. All guests join us on the Shell Pinto Performance Line. Thanks to Jim Trotter of ESPN for joining us last segment. Chris Herring of 538.com will join us in the 6 o'clock Eastern hour. 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. You're listening to Hour 23 of the Fantasy Marathon. Remember to sign up and play fantasy football on ESPN.com or in the ESPN Fantasy app. 
Oh, uh, yeah. So the fantasy drafts are coming up soon. I play one fantasy league. I don't do a bunch of leagues. I just don't have that level of patience. I play one league with a bunch of guys that I've been playing with for a very long time. I've been playing with them since before I was on television. Why? Because I can just play with them and I don't have to worry about this turning into people bragging about how they beat the dude in television. In fantasy, when in the end, we all just out here guessing. That's the thing. I always get these invitations. For you. Hey, you want to play in our fantasy league? Why? So you and your friends can stunt on me when my players get hurt. That's what this is. Plus, I really ain't got time to be going through all these magazines and stuff like that. Like, I greatly appreciate ESPN running all this stuff on the screen with these different statistics and graphics and everything else. Because otherwise, man, I just go in there picking people. Like, that, that, that's all that comes down to. I have never gotten any sort of feeling, certainly, that I got an acumen that helps me to be a fantasy winner. It's a keeper league, too. That's key. I get your keepers. My keepers tend to stink. I need to go back and look at what my keepers are. But I can tell you, man, I feel like I need to start a website. I don't know if y'all remember this. There used to be a website. Maybe that website still exists. But it used to be a website called don'tdateagirl.com. Don't date a girl. Right? Like, that's what it was. Don't date a girl. Don't date him girl.com. That's it. Don't date him girl.com. Basically, the dude to wind up doing a woman bad, she get out here and put him on don't date him girl.com to let everybody know. Don't date him girl.com. I feel like we need don't draft him dog.com. Or, in fact, don't draft him girl because there's girls out here drafting too. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't pick them up. Who are some of these guys that jump on the list? Now, some of these guys wind up on, you know, my previous list of put it all together, right? Like we had my Darren McFadden. This would be the year to put them all. He'll put it all together. And, okay, maybe for like the first six weeks, you might want to consider Darren McFadden because it may not be the year he puts it all together, but it could be a six-week period where he puts it all together while he's running behind the line and Ezekiel Elliott is. Okay, so maybe I taught you into that. But Kristen Michael, no, I don't fall for Okay, but, like, if you need a number three running back and it comes down at the end of the year, he always has a way of sneaking in and maybe getting you a touchdown. Okay, so I, okay, so maybe I'm a little confused about those. I can tell you the ones you don't pick, man, is them dudes with them cues. You know I'm talking about those dudes with those cues? Those dudes that stay questioned week after week after week. I had John Brown on my fantasy team for a couple of years. Smokey, down there with the Cardinals. I call him Q John Brown. Questionable John Brown. Stay being questionable. Every week John Brown was a question. I didn't know what to do. It was a lot like that year I had Percy Harvin on my fantasy team. This is back when it was like prime level Percy Harvin, but Percy Harvin nonetheless. You never knew them damn migraines was going to pop up. Or when Percy might punt somebody out and not be able to play. You never really had any idea what it was, but you want to stay away from Percy Harvin. I feel like a lot of other people are going to get tricked on this one. Like I saw something today on uh, the Twitters, or the Twitter where somebody was talking about C.J. Spiller, uh, wherever he plays now, and they were saying how they were raving about C.J. Spiller. Oh, no, 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 no. Even in prime, you can't count on C.J. Spiller. Not whatsoever, right? Even when you could count on him being healthy, you couldn't count on the coach giving the ball more than 10 times. Yeah, you couldn't. Like, I think it was a Marone that was talking about the thing with C.J. Spillers. After those long runs, he gets tired, so you don't give him the ball that much. Everybody gets tired after a long run. It was a long run. Give it to him again later so we can run a long time again. What are you talking about? Help us out. But no, 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 no. Don't don't, don't fall for it if anybody hits you on that. I feel like, by the way, this is the year that you need to be, like, real questionable about LaShawn McCoy. Them old running backs and running backs that got those miles on them, it's always so tempting, man. It's always so tempting, right? It's like, okay, he's going to get the ball a lot. What's he going to do when he gets the ball a lot? But he's going to get the ball a lot. You sure you know how much uh, LaShawn McCoy is actually going to be able to play? Are you positive you know how much LaShawn McCoy is? Ooh, 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 ooh. Don't draft him, dog. Don't draft him, dog. I remember a couple years ago I was telling people that was the year. Like every year it's like Marshawn Lynch. It ain't going to happen, is it? And a lot of y'all going to draft Marshawn Lynch this year. Be careful, man. Ain't no time machine. Like, I know Marshawn Lynch spent a year away from the game, but it didn't look like he spent that year in no hyperbaric chamber. He's in to be out here do, uh, putting off for the community. And while putting off for the community is a very, very good thing uh, for you to do, it does not necessarily get you ready to play more of this football. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Okay, I think that's pretty much everybody that I've got uh, for you to be skeptical of this year when fantasy comes around. I got a goal, though. I know, I know who I want my fantasy quarterback to be this year. I'm not going to tell you until I pull it off. If I get him as my fantasy quarterback, I'll let you know. If I can't get him as my fantasy quarterback, i tell you what my plan was. But I got a secret plan that is going to make my fantasy team unbeatable. And on top of making it unbeatable, make for a great radio show. That's right. And that's what fascinates me. Brought to you by Firestone Complete Auto Care. Keeping cars running newer, longer. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. Coming up next, what in the world is Hugh Jackson talking about? Thanks for listening to the Right Time Podcast. Please come back tomorrow for more. And don't forget to listen to The Right Time with Bomani Jones from 4 p.m. to 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. You're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> 
why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great. I thought.、Uh... Well, you know, when you switch to Geico, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. Geico, because saving fifteen percent or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Welcome to the Right Time Podcast. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. You can send us a tweet at the one eight hundred flowers dot com Twitter feed. That is at Bomani underscore Jones. All right, so、um, Michael Bennett and Marshawn Lynch didn't stand for the national anthem、um, over the course of the weekend. That now makes it the topic that's going to come up with more guys on more teams, right? Like it's a thing now. Like I don't think this would have necessarily come up before, but I mean, maybe it's the events of the weekend that are going to spur this a little bit more. But now we're at a point where all these guys and all these teams are going to be asked about whether or not this is something that they are going to do. Now in Oakland, it's interesting because Marshawn Lynch did not stand, and we just had Jim Trotter on of ESPN、um, a couple segments ago. And he was like, "Look, man, Jack Del Rio、uh, was not here for the Kaepernick kneeling、uh, last year, but now Marshawn Lynch is on his team, and he said that Marshawn Lynch told him this is something I've been doing for 11 years, and then we find pictures of Marshawn Lynch not doing it, and now Jack Del Rio is kind of like, 'E, I don't know what there is for me to do. I don't know what there is for me to do. Hey, I think I'll just ride along with this, right? That's what I think, and so." Here's the thing with the NFL, at least as it's going to relate to whether or not another player decides that he is going to kneel. It is best for the NFL to act like everything's all good when that happens, because when the NFL acts like everything's all good, it doesn't become a thing, or it's far less likely for it to become a thing. Like the difference between Kaepernick and all these other dudes is the other dudes waited for permission. Right now, you can make the argument that Kaepernick did, Kaepernick did not need permission, and that's fine. But the difference between Kaepernick and say、uh, Eric Reed, Arian Foster—I guess he doesn't play in the league anymore—but we could go around the league. Brandon Marshall of the Dol- of the Broncos. The difference between those guys and Kaepernick is those guys basically waited for permission because the league was like, "Yeah, we can't stop you from doing it." Like it sounds like it went to legal, and all those cats looked around and tried to figure out what it was that they could pull off, and they're like, "Yo, nothing we can do to stop them." Okay. Go ahead and do that. Now, here is what Roger Goodell had to say about it. The national anthem is a special moment to me. It's a it's a point of pride, and it's a it's that is a really important moment. And I think, but we also have to understand the other side that people do have rights, and we want to respect those. I was with the the Jets a few weeks ago, and one of the players was there, and they said, you know, there's a time and a place. That's what we all have to sort of understand: the responsibility of doing it the right time, and in the right way. And what we see is a lot of our players going in the community and really taking the platform they have and being active, and creating dialogue and actually making really positive change. And that's what I think is so important. Protest to progress is what I call it. And we all have to recognize that people want to see change. Let's go out and try to make that change happen in a peaceful. In an important way, and we've seen our players lead that. We saw it in Denver with Brandon Marshall. We saw it with Doug Baldwin in Seattle. They went out and did some really great things in the community to to affect change in a positive way, and that's what we want to see our players do. And I think it's a positive thing. So you look at Raj doing something smart. Now this is why this is Raj doing something smart. I remember、um, I read a biography of Bob Marley. Call Catch a Fire by Timothy Timothy White.、Um, you Eminem fans will remember his name.、Um, anyway,、um, Bob Marley has received the Order of Merit. I think it's the third or fourth highest honor the Jamaican government can bestow upon you. That's why you will often see Bob Marley referred to as the Honorable Robert Nestor Marley, comma O dot M, the Order of Merit. What they found later in going through the paperwork is that the plan of the Jamaican government was to ride along with this, and their idea was, if we do this, then It then makes Marley appear to be a friend of the government, which then dulls the revolutionary edge of what it is that he is doing. Right? Very interesting play to make.、Uh, we see this happen often with like when guys wind up on stamps, for example. That when this is done, it dulls the revolutionary edge of what has been done. 
That is what the league's play needs to be on the national anthem. It's not even so much we encourage guys to do this, but if they do do this, then you need to be like, yeah, well, we're on board with that. They're talking about peaceful protest, protest of progress. Yeah, that's what it is that we're looking for. That's what Roger Goodell is doing there. That's the smart play. That's the way that you do it. Because, again, the other cast that came after Kaepernick, there wasn't really any noise around them because they were doing it basically with the blessing of the league and of their teams. Now, we got two interesting situations here. One, um, Jason Garrett, the head coach of the um, Dallas Cowboys, he made the whole point about how the national anthem is sacred to me and all this stuff like this, and none of our guys are going to do this. He basically strong armored them on what they're going to do. Now, our man Jacques Taylor's come on the show, always made the point that Jason Garrett got a bunch of dudes on that team who basically do whatever he says. That's what the plan is for them. That's what they've got, right? And so Jason Garrett is comporting himself like a man who knows or at least feels like he can get out here and say that and his guys are going to fall in line. Now, here's one for you from Hugh Jackson, and uh, this might surprise you a little bit. I think everybody has a right to do, you know, and I, and I get it, but the national anthem means a lot uh, to myself personally, our organization, our football team. I hope, you know, again, I can't speak. I haven't really talked to our team about it. I would hope we don't have those issues. I understand there's a lot going on in the world. Uh, I like to just keep it here. You know, what we deal with, we try to deal with as a team in our closed environment. We talk about things, but uh, hopefully that won't happen. By the way, Hugh is short for Huey. In terms of you looking for, like, ironic situations that come up. Now, I talk to people that know a little bit more, and that's Hugh Jackson. Like, I think a lot of people look at that as like, oh, man, you don't want the money to mess with him. Nah, 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 nah. That appears to be the way that Hugh Jackson himself feels and i'm just like look man y'all are all playing this badly every single one of you that is doing it like this is playing this badly say hey these guys have their right to do whatever and then once that happens man i'm telling you y'all aren't gonna have any problems if you play it like that but once you play it as a no i don't want these dudes to do this then all the people gonna start fighting to fight for them once you make that play no, 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 no. Go out there and say, hey, man, you got the right to do whatever it is that you want to do. And then they'll go ahead and do it. They'll be on camera for a little bit as it goes. But look, Colin taking all the bullets for everybody. I think we'd all agree upon that, right? Colin is taking the bullets for everyone. Like, I don't think there's anyone else that's going to wind out, wind up himself being singled out in this situation. Now, maybe it's a thing for these guys, like for Jackson and for Jason Garrett, where they see where the tide is going, and as a result, maybe just maybe, they just want to make sure that they don't have any more problems than they absolutely have to. I totally can see how that would be the thing. But lording over cats is never going to be the thing that works. It never will. Not in a time like this, because I'm telling you, man, that frustration is riding high with a whole lot of people. And with that happening, the last thing they're trying to do is let this football coach be the one to tell them what to do. Right. You're not going to win by suppressing this, especially when everybody involved knows, hey, man, y'all don't really have the standing. All right? Like, you can go ahead and cut somebody if you want. So, like, a guy at the end of the bench, you might be able to keep them in line, but nobody cares about the dudes at the end of the bench anyway. It's the dude whose names you know that you got to worry about kneeling or not standing or whatever it winds up being. Guys at the end of the bench, no, they ain't doing nothing. Mental contracts ain't guaranteed. They backs is all the way straight. All the way. At least they're going to be. But you're going to mess around and defend some dude that matters to your football team. And that dude's going to do it. And he ain't cutting them all. Right? Even Kaepernick last year, they didn't cut him. Now, granted, there was the injury stuff and everything else, and they couldn't exactly do that. And he was the best quarterback that happened to be on the roster. Right? But, oh, no, 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 no. There's going to be some cat you can't release that decides to do this. If your play is to try to tell grown men what to do, because at some point you wind up getting a measure of resistance from that. And once that happens, man, really, good luck to you. Try to pull that off. I'm just telling you, as a league, strategically, you want to make this go away? Let these dudes do it. What you're going to wind up with in all likelihood is what happened last year. You're going to have a couple of dudes do this for a week or two. And then after that week or two passes, they're going to move on to something else. Now, who knows? Maybe the world going to keep on being crazy like the world been crazy, and they're going to keep doing it. At which point, them dudes not standing up is going to wind up being the least of your concerns. Right. Let these dudes exercise their rights. They'll exercise their rights. Everybody will keep it moving. Try to stand in their way. becomes a matter of pride. You're going to have a fight that even if you win, you will ultimately lose. 
All right, 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number coming up next. We're getting some more reporting out of what's going on with Cleveland and the Cavs and Kyrie and LeBron. You think they'll be on the same team in October? You're listening to ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Sirius XM Channel 80. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. Chris Herring of 538.com will join us next segment. Chris Herring will join us at 630 Eastern. That's the old soul song of the day, Maybe Your Baby by Stevie Wonder. By the way, Stevie, when you go through the catalog, like this song getting so much about Stevie Dirty Mac. And, but his catalog is very, ha- very, very heavy in the, you know, you're not supposed to be doing that uh, segment of stuff. It's almost like Stevie can see the game in a way y'all don't give him credit for it. See all the angles. I mean, the part-time lover, man, the dude was talking about flashing the light on and off so that you know that, you know, you home or not. I'm just saying, Stevie, what good that do you? 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. Uh, We talked a little bit here. Oh, by the way, I forgot. ESPN Fantasy Football Marathon is currently going on, so make sure you sign up and play on ESPN.com or in the ESPN Fantasy app. Play in a private league with friends. Join a public league. Be matched with other ESPN fans. You play up into 25 leagues, baby, completely free. Fantasy Football Marathon brought to you by DraftKings. Yeah. All right, 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. Some of these dudes in the national anthem, the possibility of people not standing. Like, you realize this. Think about it. Every time a coach says, no, nah, I'm good with my guys not standing for the national anthem, it is a non-story. Say you go make a fuss about your guys standing for the national anthem. Story, 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 story. It's almost as if, by the way, um, by saying this, the coaches wind up being distractions. Right? Is, it, is that not the case? Like, isn't it interesting that the whole idea is that, you know, we don't want any distraction? If you're a coach and you don't want a distraction, say you're not tripping on this. Or I suppose the way to put it is, you don't want to be distracted, don't be distracted. I understand it's very simple, but, you know, focus. All right, 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. So we got Kyrie. We got LeBron. What is going to happen here? Uh, Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN reported today that the Cavs are looking at this and trying to get back a franchise player. They want a young player. They want a franchise player. But that's what they want. They want a franchise player. And it is, again, rare that a player as good as Kyrie Irving gets traded but is not the best player in that trade. And the only way that the Cavs can get a franchise player back in that trade is if they get a player better than Kyrie Irving, as the way I see it, Kyrie Irving is not a franchise player. Now, uh, here is Brian Winhurst of ESPN. He was on Sports Center with David Lloyd. And here's what he said about what's difficult about making the Kyrie trade happen. What the Cavs have been trying to do here is figure out a way to thread the needle about how they could trade Kyrie Irving, get maximum value, protect themselves in the short run, and protect themselves in the long run. That's an awfully darn hard thing to pull off with the youngest general manager in the league and an owner behind him who is willing to spend but is also temperamental. (laughs) Yeah, hold on. Play that one more time for me, please. What the Cavs have been trying to do here is figure out a way to thread the needle about how they could trade Kyrie Irving, get maximum value, protect themselves in the short run, and protect themselves in the long run. That's an awfully darn hard thing to pull off with the youngest general manager in the league and an owner behind him who is willing to spend but is also temperamental. All right, now I would say that while that sounds ambitious, at this point in the process, this is how the Cavs should play it. There's no reason right now for them not to be ambitious. Now, certainly I would say that if I were running the Cavs, I want to make sure that Kyrie's not on the roster on opening night. But you don't really have to do that if you don't want to. I think it would be best to get him out of there before opening night. But you don't have to pull that off before opening night. They should try to get everything. They should. They are not going to get everything, but they should, in fact, try to get everything. Now, one of the questions in this for me is, how far are they willing to go to get Kyrie out of there? And by saying how far are they willing to go, it is, are you willing to make a trade with anybody, anybody at all? And why would I say anybody at all? Well, a team that has a lot of the assets that one would think the Cavaliers need need in order to make it happen would be the Celtics because the Celtics have all of the assets. 
Now, here's Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN talking about the Cavs' willingness to trade with the Celtics. Boston is an intriguing target for Cleveland. They are not afraid to do a deal with the Celtics, even though they're com- they're conference rivals and they'll be competing with them for the Eastern Championship wow. this year because Boston has overwhelmingly the best possible package of picks, uh, of players, especially young ones. And, and as I reported in the piece, Jason Tatum, who the Celtics drafted out of Duke this year, is, is a player that really intrigues um, Cleveland. But right now, there's been no real discussion between those two teams about Tatum. I mean, so if you're the Celtics, number one, this idea of a Kyrie-Isaiah Thomas pairing, right? Why would you do that? <laughs> like, basically what you are saying is we're going to score all the points in the world, and it's going to be turnstiles for every guard on the other side. Like, I don't know how many teams are going to win games against the Celtics if they have that pairing, but every guard in the in the East has got to be like, oh, yeah, do that. Do that. You imagine John Wall and Brad Beal salivating at the idea they get to go up against Isaiah Thomas and Kyrie Irving? Like, can you imagine that? Just the thought? Like, bro, we, I, I go for 50. You go for 50. No, no, same game, bro. We both go for 50. We might not even pass the ball to none of these other cats. Because why would we pass the ball to all these other cats? We open all game. All the game, if that were to happen. Uh, the other part, and I just – the game theory on it, man, I just can't see how it is that either side would be willing to do something that they feel like strengthens the other side. So with the Cavs, for example, they want to set themselves up in a way where they're built for the long haul. Look, the Celtics are – I mean, I don't care what anybody says. The Celtics aren't really playing it for what they need to do right now. If they were playing it for what they need to do right now, they would have moved those picks for like assets that were a little bit closer to maturity, right? Celtics are playing this for the long run. Why would you set the Cavs up for the long run? Why would you? Like, maybe you think that you can do something that decimates the Cavs in the short run and gives you a better chance at winning the East, maybe? I don't know. But no, no, no. Why would you help build them up? No, I don't see that trade being the one that is going to happen. It certainly would be intriguing, but I don't see that as being the one that would happen. I just don't. The one good thing for Kyrie, though, if Kyrie went to the Celtics, he'd be like, wow, so I'm somewhere where they hate LeBron even more than I do. Ain't that something? Because, yeah, they, they, they're not I, – I don't feel like LeBron – or, like, LeBron's teams, they've had, like, these rivalries kind of here and there. But the real is LeBron has had a Boston rivalry, right? It has been LeBron versus Boston. And, look, Boston got the upper hand on LeBron quite a bit at first in this, right? Uh, they, they got him uh, 2008 in the, in the Eastern Conference semifinals. 2010, the worst LeBron series I think we've ever seen. The Cavs were, I mean, the Celtics on the other side of that. Then LeBron got over him a couple times while he was there in Miami. Then LeBron got him this last time. Like, he is the rival of an entire city, which is kind of fascinating to consider. Like, I think all parties involved with, like, this idea of, yeah, we can go take on LeBron. The Cavs got to be like, nah, 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 chill out, chill out. I still believe, by the way. Cavs need to play everything for this upcoming season. Like, and I think getting Kyrie out of there might wind up making them better off for this upcoming season, but play for the upcoming season. This idea that we need to be strengthened for what happens after LeBron leaves. Here's what happens after LeBron leaves. You're not a title contender. There's nothing that you could realistically pull off that'll make you a title contender after LeBron leaves. After he leaves, you're not a title contender. Y'all need to play for right now. Not later. Not right now. Right now is what you got. It took you 50 damn years to win a championship. You better try to get this second while you can. Otherwise, ain't none of us going to be around to watch them get the next one. And if we are around, I mean, chewing your own food, you'll be reminiscing on it. That's a back-in-the-day sort of situation for you. All right, 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. Coming up next, did the NBA get what they wanted when it comes to eliminating the DNP rest with the new schedule? We'll talk to Chris Herring of 538.com on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Sirius XM, Channel 80. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. All guests join us on the Shell Penzo Performance Line, just like our next guest, Check him out at 538.com. Does great statistical analysis on sports. His name is Chris Herring. Now, Chris, we got the new schedule from the NBA. The NBA wants to get rid of DNP rest. Do you think the schedule will accomplish it? It should. Um, It's getting tougher to see how teams are going to be able to get around this. I mean, obviously, if if players are injured beforehand, no, you know, there's there's no way they're just going to 
these games, but but putting an extra day or two of rest before and then also after these games, before they go into these marquee Saturday ABC games and Sunday ABC games, you would think that it's a little bit tougher to make the argument that Pop has a, a rationale to hold out Kawhi Leonard or that Steve Kerr has a rationale to hold out all four of his stars from the Warriors. So it, it seems like it's it's a step in the right direction. They had that really embarrassing two-week stretch there where they had uh, the Warriors who were going to play the Spurs and then the Cavs are going to play the Clippers. And in both of those games, you had almost um, one whole team that decided to hold people out. And actually that Warriors-Spurs game, Kawhi was out, Parker was out, and then all of the, the top four guys from the Warriors were out. So they're trying to avoid that happening anymore going forward. I mean, we basically haven't had a good Warriors-Spurs regular season game in the last two <laughs> years, right? Every time we think we're getting it, it's like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I mean, these are two teams that really, when you think about it, obviously they're, they're elite teams because of who who's on that team and who, who are on those teams. But they also are very, very ahead of the curve when it comes to not worrying about what other people think about the way they rest their players. And they're, they're very proactive about resting guys and, and paying attention to the monitors that these guys wear in practice to make sure that they're not totally run down before they go out there and play. And so it, it, it makes sense. And, you know, I think it's good that these coaches don't have to worry about this dance anymore, uh, that they'll actually have legitimate rest going into these games. And obviously the league can potentially be happy too now that they don't have to worry about uh, fans getting angry with them if they're making a long trip to see a game when a team comes to town once a year and worry about TV partners getting upset at, at carrying these games um, when when the stars aren't out there on the court. All right, talking to Chris Herring of 538 here on the right time. Now, in looking at the schedule, is it enough to make you wonder why they didn't do this sooner? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the league for forever, you know, you kind of look at the the round peg square hole sort of thing, and obviously the league is not going to play less games or fewer games. That would probably be the best remedy for injuries and competitive postseason but you know the next best thing if you're going to keep the number of games the same try to find ways to just expand the schedule and frankly you know it's going to be an extra week this year but even that one week allows them to get rid of all the four game and five night scenarios which those are just brutal when I covered the Knicks I hated when the Knicks had four games and five nights particularly when they were on the road just because I felt like I couldn't catch my breath and just have a day where there's nothing happening. You still have a practice to cover on that fifth day a lot of times. So I hated that. I couldn't imagine what it was like for them um, physically to go through that, um, especially guys that are playing 35 minutes a night. So that you, you're able to eliminate that completely. You're able to cut out another back-to-back scenarios that these guys would otherwise have. And if you remember back to, I think, two years ago, the league actually was able to cut down on some of those back-to-back scenarios, but the way that they were able to do it was that they, they basically, um, they changed the length of the all-star weekend. They made it a full week, I think, instead of just like those three or four days. Um, And what it actually ended up doing, it it ended up making the rest of the schedule even more confined and then having more of these games where they had fewer days to kind of recover. And so they were kind of manipulating it a little bit to make it look like they were doing something that was player friendly. So it's good to see them going in the other direction and giving them more time to recover, putting these same amount of games in a bigger time frame instead of condensing it down the way they did a couple of years. All right, playing fast to- and loose with the numbers. All right, talking to Chris Herring of 538.com here on the right time. Now, in the research that you've done, how important is it for the players, though, that they are going to be stretching this out? Well, I think it's important. I mean, there, there's been data, and it, it kind of feels like ESPN has kind of been sounding maybe the loudest drumbeat on some of this. That the numbers, even some of the more obscure numbers, where you look at more dunks these players are, are making and completing on nights where they're rested versus when they have a back-to-back, they just don't have the energy to play the same. And some players have kind of described this as almost feeling, uh, or coaches have almost said that Doc Rivers has said that the players look they play almost drunkenly when they are playing four games in five nights or five games in seven nights. And so it it presents a lot of us watching the games can tell when a team has played on two or three consecutive nights, there's a major difference in in just the quality of the play. And obviously if we're getting to watch LeBron versus not getting to see him or Kawhi Leonard, I mean, it's a plus from that standpoint too, that you don't feel like 
these guys are just going out there because they, they have to for marketing or for TV ratings or anything like that, that they actually feel good enough to do it without worrying if they're going to get hurt or worrying if they're going to be able to play up to their standards. And so I think it makes a big difference. Statistically, we've always seen it make a big difference and to see um, in terms of fouls and everything else. It's just an ugly game when you've got teams that aren't well enough rested playing each other, especially in, in the limelight and these big matchups where we're sitting down on Sunday afternoon to watch the game. You don't want to see them tired playing in the first or second quarter of a game. Uh, you can just tell a major difference. Yeah, and I think we're talking to Chris Herring of 538 here on the right time. I think one thing that's kind of hard for fans is like this idea that, oh, wow, the big superstar athletes are tired. Almost like they ignore that, look, man, these games aren't easy to play. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, like I was saying before, I, I get tired, you know, lazy old me gets tired going and traveling to these games and getting it. I think you, you think about the airplane. Yeah, they're in Ritz Carlton's. But the idea of having to travel and specifically having to travel long distances for some of these games, I mean, that was part of the reason I wanted to, to move to Chicago myself from New York is that I wouldn't have to take these coast to coast flights constantly. Um, you know, the Warriors have incredible distances that they travel for their games in some cases because sometimes the schedule isn't all that friendly to them and because the schedule wants them to be in certain places to be able to play these national TV games. And so it requires them flying longer distances than pretty much anyone else. And so the the stat that I thought that was really telling, Tom Haberstrow had one yesterday that he put in a story and mentioned on SportsCenter. Last year, the Warriors had four, five games uh, that they played on ABC Sunday. Four of those games were part of a back-to-back. This year, they're going to have six games on ABC in prime time, and none of those games will be in back-to-back scenarios. So that that's where I'm saying I think it kind of undercuts this idea that you have to rest these guys and that you've got to use those marquee games to do it. I think the league wanted to try to find a way, basically an ironclad way to say, you can't just wiggle your way out of this now by saying that you're resting guys, because we're giving you, we're we're specifically going to build in enough rest for you to be able to have these guys not be tired, have enough time where they're off, and then they should be able to come in relatively fresh for these games. So I don't think there's going to be as much of an excuse for these guys to be able to sit out these games now because the league has tried to build in enough infrastructure for them to take time off right before and then right after these major games. By the way, you also touched on maybe the most interesting thing about this schedule. The Warriors got 43 nationally televised games. <laughs> so, you know, it's the thing. I, I personally can. Uh, I think it kind of waters down um, the idea of, you know, when you do actually have them on and it's a marquee game. But at the same time, you know, I've got to be honest, if it's between them and, trying to get Orlando on two or three times just for the sake of, um, you know, the, the sort of equality that we see with regards to the all-star game in baseball where every team gets a representative. No, nah, I'm okay with that. I'll, I'll watch the Warriors <laughs> if I have to. Not that bad a punishment. <laughs> All right, that's Chris Harry. Check him out, 538.com, covering the NBA. My man, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Take it easy. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. All guests join us on the Shell Penzo Performance Line. Thanks to Chris Herring of 538.com for joining us last segment. Thanks to Jim Trotter of ESPN for joining us in the 5 o'clock Eastern Hour. Thanks to Dominique Foxworth of ESPN Radio for joining us in the 4 o'clock Eastern Hour. Remember, if you miss anything live, check out the Right Time Podcast available on the ESPN app. Also, the ESPN Fantasy Football Marathon is currently going on, so make sure you sign up and play at ESPN.com or in the ESPN Fantasy app. Play in a private league with friends, join a public league, and be matched with other ESPN fans. Play up to 25 leagues. Totally free. Fantasy Football Marathon is presented by DraftKings. All right, 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. Shannon's out today. So, Nuno, what will we miss out on today? We know you can't be on top of all the news and information of the day. Now, if you haven't heard... All right, so as we everyone knows, Kyrie wants out of Cleveland. The Cavs want answers from LeBron. LeBron won't give him any answers. And if you missed it, here's Bamani talking about who really has the power in all this situation. Hold on, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, bro, wait a minute, bro, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The Cavs think they go strong on LeBron into making some level of commitment to them. Are you serious? Like, has any threat ever been more empty than the Cavs saying? We gonna make trades for the future if you don't give us an answer, LeBron. Probably looking at them like, fine, then don't. What are you talking about? 
Right? Like, there's no way in the world that LeBron is buying that one. None whatsoever. Like, to me, this doesn't even sound to me truly like it is the Cavs and Kyrie and LeBron making moves. One, there is no move that Kyrie is able to make. Right? Like, Kyrie doesn't have it in him to make a move. He's the guy with two years left on his contract. He's the dude that doesn't have anywhere to go. Right? No, 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 no. Kyrie, all he can do is just sit around and wait for the trade to wind up happening. Now, the Cavaliers are in an interesting place when it comes to trying to figure out what to do with trades because there is a future that they have to prepare for without LeBron James. See, here's the thing that LeBron has going for him that gives him a common level of power, especially within this situation. Kyrie is out here like, man, I sure hope they trade me to a situation that's good, right? The Cavs are like, well, we sure would like to be a contender, even if LeBron's gone. LeBron's like, I am the walking definition of contention. I show up, it's a contender, right? You drop LeBron off, put him on the New Orleans Pelicans, it's a contender. You take LeBron, drop him off in the French Quarter, get 11 dudes, it's a contender. Take LeBron off the Cavs, it's Cleveland. That's what we got, guys. Like, like, like that. That is, that is what we have here. I'm trying to think of how hard LeBron's laughing at the idea that the Cavs think they' about to strong arm LeBron James. Where the hell we all been for the last 14 years? If the Cavs are ever in a position to try to strong arm LeBron James into something, I feel pretty confident they would have done it already. They ain't got the juice to strong arm LeBron. They don't have the power to strong arm LeBron. And on top of not having the power to strong arm LeBron, I would think that they would have the good sense to know not to strong arm LeBron. But here we are talking about Dan Gilbert and good sense. So let me ask you this. Do you think we can get at a point this year that LeBron gets traded? No, I mean, he has the no no trade clause, and I imagine that he would exercise that all the way until the end. I can't think they'd do anything crazy enough to make him exercise the no trade clause. But I do believe if that trade clause did not exist, the smart play for the Cavs, if they were trying to play for the future, the smart play would be to trade LeBron James. Except ain't nothing tr- smart about trading LeBron James. All right, speaking of LeBron James, a couple days ago he tweeted out, uh, he was looking for a pickup game. So apparently, and he showed up in New York with Kevin Durant and Carmelo Anthony. So let me ask you, if let's say you're you're playing, your team just won, and they have next. You sticking around? No chance. No chance. No, 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 no chance. Because I feel like the only reason for dudes like that to come out there and play pickup ball against regular people is just because they want to dunk on food. Like, I can't think of any other motivation that you got being LeBron, being like, I want to go out here and play against regular people. No, sir, Rebob. I'm not, I, I have never dreamed of getting dunked on by my favorite player. No, no. I've dreamed of watching my favorite player dunk on some homeboys, or on top of that, more importantly, people I don't like. But not me, myself. What are you, high? Yeah, apparently, LeBron was, LeBron was on a team uh, by himself in terms of Carmelo and. Uh, Kevin Durant played on the same team. I guess J.R. Smith, Enos Cantor, Lance Thomas, Dante Jones, and Marshall Plumley were there. Wait, wait, wait a minute. They let Lance Thomas, Dante Jones, and Marshall Plumley play with them? Yeah, they were. Uh, <laughs> they were, they were those are the dudes that need to be like, they must only want to dunk on us. Uh, all right, so everyone loves Shaq, right? Uh, and Shaq has some sort of uh, minority stake in the Kings. And Shaq was on a podcast uh, which is called the Wizards Tip Off Podcast, and they were talking about the Wizards, and he said uh, they lost an important piece, Otto Porter. He's now playing for my team in Sacramento. No. Do we give no. Shaq a pass? No, because his job is talking about this stuff. Like, let's just say for a second, maybe he'd have just been like just some regular dude who got it wrong. No, he like it's like an owner who doesn't know anything. He works on the NBA. Shaq. And who told Shaq that? Uh, I don't know. Maybe he got confused with the fact that they were gonna, they were supposed to sign him to an offer sheet, and that didn't happen. Uh, <sighs> exactly. Uh, speaking of Maryland, real quick, uh, Georgetown is hosting a Millennial Day uh, offer during a soccer game against UCLA. Uh, so, real quick, they're going to give you out a participation trophy just for showing up as a fan because. They feel that millennials, all they want is that. Uh, they're going to set up a nap time during the game for millennial fans if they want to take an, a nap. Going a little too far? I mean, do they really think any millennials are going to show up to be insulted? <laughs> right? Like, like, what do you – come on, man. Like, I like making jokes about the kids as much as the next man, but I'm not going to patronize them like that. When I clown the millennials, I clown. 
It ain't going to be no backhanded sort of thing. It's a full-on clown. Dang. But ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. We do this every weekday, 4 p.m. Eastern. Nuno, Cat, thanks so much. Thanks for listening to The Right Time Podcast. Please come back tomorrow for more. And don't forget to listen to The Right Time with Bomani Jones from 4 p.m. to 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Okay, keep your eyes closed. Okay. I want to show you my first ever painting. Mm, all right. Okay. Open your eyes. Oh, that's a lot of colors mm-hmm. <laughs> and shades. So be honest. What do you think? Well, uh, I like how if you switch to Geico, you could save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Here, why don't I hold...